ripping the bark off the tree. Uh, ripped the bark off the trees in the schoolyard. And they were so upset about this. And I went out and we, we, uh, they marched around the schoolyard with save our trees, save our trees sign, these little six and seven year olds. And I, obviously I started a unit on trees, why they're important, why we need them, why animals need them. And from that day forward, every grade I taught, I had an environmental um, framework for integrating all the subject matter in my um, teaching practice. So that's an example. And Susan? Yeah, so um, I had the great privilege of uh, having a lot of unsupervised outdoor time as a child. And I think that just made me develop a love relationship with nature. And I almost feel like uh, being in nature is synonymous with a good childhood. So um, as a teacher, I've always tried to incorporate some environmental and outdoor education into what I do. Um, so both in the classroom and extracurricularly. So I took kids to eco camp and um, had the great experience of being at an outdoor education center for four years. And so, yeah, I mean, I think there's just an op you can teach almost anything outdoors and with an environmental focus. And I think it's really important that we do that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so how about um, Jay Purden? I don't know your first name, so <laughs> Jay Purden? That's Jennifer. You, you, Jennifer, yeah, thank That's you. That's me. Hi, everybody. I'm an old friend of Susan's and um, I'm joining you from Vancouver. And I work in um, a supported homeschooling program uh, with kids kindergarten to grade eight. And, um, and in the, we've always had a sort of an environmental um, outdoorsy component to our program, the, the face to face classes that we teach. But last for the last, I'd say five years, Karen, she's one of my coworkers here, Karen, it's been about um, Five years we've had an actual outdoor program and then last year we took everything outdoors for COVID so we taught outdoors exclusively two days a week for COVID which was really good. Great thank you and Karen. Hi I'm Karen Blackburn and um, as Jen said I work with her we uh, teach in teach from New Westminster in BC so um, yeah, we've always done some outdoor education things in our program, within our program. And um, I did my master's uh, started in 2007 and that was on learning, and learning environments and ecology. And from that, we kind of grew our outdoor education programs. And so just continuing on on how to integrate that into everything we do and moving forward after, after this into other yeah. areas for me. Okay. Thank you. Now, Anne has put it, her, her information in the chat, but Anne, would you like to tell us about yourself a little bit? Yeah, hi, I'm Anne, um, and I, I try, so I've got the information, I'm at, I teach grade two, first time this year, I was teaching kindergarten before, and we always tried to get out and um, talk and look, you know, use nature as a starting point for a lot of activities like math and things like that. Um, it is a, a bit of a, um, a challenge in winter and we because we're in a community where we have a lot of uh, families that are new to this climate. So they're used to being inside, right? They, yeah. they just that's how they always kind of lived. And so it's it's the thing of, of just say, okay, let's have the right clothing. We can yeah. help if you don't have it. And, and it's just a thing we do, we can be outside and I use the selling point and you know, it's the kids don't have to wear their mask <laughs> the same way when we're outside, the kids love it. Yeah. So we just try and, and use, you know, use that, that point that it's really a good thing to do, especially now. Thank you. Yeah. Julianne? Hey everybody. I'm uh, new to this group, but I'm very excited to be joining. Um, I, I'm not a teacher, but I have started a community group in which we do stewardship activities. And I see a lot of uh, importance in teaching people about their local watersheds uh, and the local environment that they find themselves in. And so 
yeah, over the past year, I've kind of just been building a volunteer organization and uh, I'm looking to create some more learning materials and I've, I've been approaching some school groups in my own area. Um, so I'm just happy to sit. Which there area is that, and... Julian? Where did you say you were living? So uh, majority of the work that I'm doing is in Aurora. Okay. Um, Thank and you. I currently live in London and I'm only just starting to uh, get some, get the ball rolling down here. Okay. Um, Thank yeah, in a little bit, two different places in Ontario. Okay, thank you. Lucy. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Lucy. I'm um, a school teacher in Toronto. Uh, I predominantly have been working with the grade five to eight um, students, but this year I'm a learning coach actually for the board. So, um, I would say similar to Anne, I feel like I'm on borrowed time. I apologize because my three boys are swirling around me and it's dinner time. So <laughs> if you okay. see me cut out, there's a reason for it. Um, but anyway, I, I like Anne, you know, I'm used to working with um, students and families who aren't really climatized to, you know, our outdoor nature and our, our, um, our climate, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always been really interested in um, and excited to expose our students to lots of different learning outdoor opportunities. So taking them to places like Kearney and whatnot has always been, you know, highlights because they haven't been able to, again, uh, be exposed to a lot of these pieces. But also, um, I just think there's so much inquiry to be done with our natural world and our natural Thank spaces. You, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm not, to be honest, I'm not like the most outdoorsy person I'll be honest about that but I'm always so willing to kind of learn and expand my own horizon with that regard and and then you know hopefully push that forward with uh, the teachers that I work with the educators and the okay. students that I work with as well so okay can you say again which school board you're with Toronto I'm with I'm with the TDSB the Toronto yeah, okay. District School Board thank you mm -hmm. and you're welcome and thank you mm -hmm. May is May there? I, okay, yeah, I'm right here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am, uh, as Safa has mentioned earlier, I'm one of uh, OC's uh, board members. Um, I work with, um, actually work with community organization. I work with uh, the Afghan Women Organization. Uh, it's a settlement organization, but I try to include uh, as much as possible, the environment, like environmental aspect uh, or lens uh, in the settlement work. I work as a volunteer coordinator at the organization. Thank you. Okay, so um, during this presentation, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. I'm going to share my screen. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we'll have some time, a few minutes at the end for, for um, questions and comments. And also just so that you know, uh, Susan and I haven't been doing online teaching in the last two years, the way many of you have. So just excuse any glitches with the tech. And um, we're actually gonna cover quite a lot of ground tonight. And obviously it's not the way anybody would teach it, but we just wanted to give you a full picture of the resource. And I'm just going to, as I said, share my screen. Whoops, no, okay. Okay, so um, welcome to understanding and protecting your local watershed. So it's really interesting that we have a combination of teachers and community support workers here. It's very interesting. Our agenda will include a land acknowledgement in a moment and some, we've done the welcome basically. We'll give you some background to the resource package, a brief overview and ways to use the resource. And then the bulk of the presentation will be a student slideshow and activities which we will elaborate on in the teacher's guide. And then there will be time for questions and comments. So the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition recognizes and acknowledges the lands originally used and occupied by First Peoples of the Williams Treaties First Nations and other Indigenous peoples. And on behalf of the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition, we'd like to thank them for sharing this land. 
We'd also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation as our closest First Nation community and recognize the unique relationship the Chippewas have with the lands and waters of this territory. They are the water protectors and environmental stewards of these lands and we join them in these responsibilities. Now you no doubt have your own land acknowledgement that you use in your own environments. Um, and we are all learning and are at different stages in our understanding of First Nations perspectives and our commitment to learning is the key. And especially in the past year with all those revelations um, about the unmarked graves just become even more, um, more, more out there and, and more incumbent on us to keep learning. In our resource, we use the term First Nations to refer to their history, presence and perspectives. And there's just something to consider that the Truth and Reconciliation Final Report Executive Summary, the commissioners were repeatedly reminded that true reconciliation will never occur unless we're also reconciled with the earth. So that's an interesting framework within which to do your environmental education. Okay, what's happening here? Here's my... So we've done the we've done the welcome part. Um, the presentation will be 45 to 60 minutes long. And again, as I said, please put questions or comments in the chat, and we'll have some time at the end to to deal with those. I wanted to start with this video by a grade six student from Shanty Bay Public School in the northeast um, area of Lake Simcoe. And inherent in everything she says is the learning that has taken place as she studied issues around the lake. She was vibrant and full of life. She was deep and she wanted us to know her. Always a wonderful provider. She protected all those she cared for. She was always changing and renewing and could never resist an opportunity to splash a little fun into our lives. The description at the beginning was not about a person, but about the lake near my home. The lake has been a part of my life for a long time, and I would like to share the reasons why she is both awesome and important, why she needs our help, and how we can work to keep her strong and healthy so we never have to remember her in a eulogy. The lake in my story is Lake Simcoe. The earliest known name for Lake Simcoe is Uenteronk, meaning beautiful water in the Huron language. When I think about the lake, I think about looking for tiny pieces of pottery and shells on the shore, jumping off the pier, holding hands with my mom, watching huge schools of tiny fish swimming in unison and skiing and skating along the crusty, cold surface in the winter. Lake Simcoe is a great center for tourism and recreation, making $200 million a year for the local economy. More importantly, though, the Lake Simcoe watershed provides clean drinking water for 450,000 people. The water and shorelines provide many diverse habitats for animals, plants, and insects whose lives depend on the health of the lake. There are 50 different species of fish alone that make the lake their home. Everything in Lake Simcoe's ecosystem is connected. And when we make bad choices in one area, it causes stress all through the lake environment. Climate change is a major problem that Lake Simcoe is facing. Additionally, invasive species such as the round goby and zebra mussel are harming the lake's biodiversity. They say too much salt spoils a meal, and it is the same with fresh water. Winter road salt runs down into the lake and makes it very hard for freshwater fish to live there. And salt is only the second worst problem. When phosphorus from things like fertilizers, detergents, and sewage gets into the soil and the soil washes away into the lake, it disturbs the ecosystem. Another way that we are stressing Lake Simcoe is through our negligent use of plastic. Whether it be from the garbage scattered on the beach or the tiny beads of plastic in some soaps, we need to be aware that when plastic breaks down in the water, it gets ingested by fish and other organisms. And once it is in the food chain, 
it affects all other creatures in the food web, including us. So, what do we do now? Well, let me start with what I'm doing. I've made an art installation made mostly with garbage and plastic. I'm trying to show how we are destroying our clean water sources. I have created a blog. You can check it out at makecleanwaterhappen.blogspot.com. There you will find information on how to clean up our water resources. I have encouraged grown-ups and other kids to make a pledge to reduce their plastic use by changing even one habit, like ordering drinks without straws, or opting out of getting a cheap, useless plastic toy in a kid's meal at certain fast food restaurants. What else can we really do to help? Let's use sand instead of salt on our roads and driveways. Avoid using fertilizers. Let's protect our lake's natural shorelines and understand how to prevent invasive species. And finally, let's keep plastic and other garbage out of the water. For more ideas, go to the Lake Simcoe Conservation website. David Suzuki says, All of us can make a difference. Use your voice, your devices, your lifestyle choices, or your time and talents. The collective action adds up to the urgently needed change. We need to make Lake Simcoe our lake. She is awesome. We are making choices that threaten her. But we can make changes to help before it's too late, before the beautiful water, the original name of Lake Simcoe, is just a memory. As Joni Mitchell sings, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. So, very inspiring young woman, and I think she's now in grade eight, and I don't think she has that blog anymore, but um, it really shows what can happen. So, the resource was originally created by the Education Committee of the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition. It was designed to inspire student-led investigations of their local environment and make connections to the lake to be used from grade one through grade 12. We did a pilot in Innisfil last fall, and we got great feedback, even though COVID restrictions meant that teachers couldn't take the kids outside on field trips much. Now it's been modified so it can be used all around the watershed and in fact, in any watershed. Here's some work samples from the pilot. This is, these kids were in grade four and grade five, I think. So this is an example of a watershed model made out of plasticine. And on the right, there's a shield. So students were asked to create a shield and show why we needed to protect Lake Simcoe. The next was another assignment, another choice they had was to make a poster about why they love the lake. And here's a learning wall from the grade four or five class where the students started off by drawing pictures of the different habitats around the area, around their area. This is their area. And then they proceeded to draw pictures of species that live there and also some human activities and the impacts. And that you can't read the labels too well maybe, but they labeled the human impacts, the sewage, the chemicals, the fertilizer, phosphorus, pesticides, etc. And it really is a great demonstration of what that class learned. So the resource consists of a student slideshow, a teacher's guide, and there is a 20 minute recorded overview. And you will be sent this once this workshop is completed. The curriculum links provided in the teacher's guide for science, social studies, and geography for grades one through 12. And you probably already know, this group probably already knows there's a common framework for environmental education and it's in the it, this quote from Shaping Our Schools, Shaping Tomorrow is there in all levels of curriculum, whether it's uh, primary, middle school, or secondary. The resource was made in the context of the Lake Simcoe watershed, but as you'll see, the content and concepts are applicable in any watershed. As we go through the slides and teacher's guide, be thinking about how you can adapt to your particular audience in terms of age, grade, location and your preferred time change. 
Some teachers may use it as a theme for the whole year. Some may just teach a one term unit. Some may use parts of it in isolation and some will team teach it with colleagues, maybe of the same grade level or in a learning buddies model with an older and younger class and exact and community groups can use the information in this package as well. However, it's used we emphasize the importance of getting students outside investigating their environment. So now we're going to move to showing some slides and activities. I'm going to begin by showing you the introduction to the teacher's guide. Um, in the introduction, there's a there's a, a letter uh, to educators and a lot of the information in that letter I, I've already just covered. And at the bottom of that page, um, I uh, there is the the links to the curriculum. So right, say if you go to the bottom of the page, those are the curriculum links there. And then there's a table of contents, and this gives a roadmap to the to the resource, to both the slideshow and the resource. So we put it in these sections. So there's an introductory section where we talk about why lakes matter, why some First Nations history and presence, why water matters. We define some terms and, and make sure there's some basic understandings. And then we move into an introduction on human impacts on water. Uh, there's quite a, a, a substantial section on habitats called natural heritage features in uh, the conservation uh, literature. And um, a, a lot of uh, activities and research and field trip ideas for, um, for people in that section. And then we move back to human impacts in, in a bit more detail, focusing on phosphorus and the effect on specific species of fish in lakes and some of the activities that you can do to, to mitigate that impact. And then the last section is protection. What can we do and how is, how is it being protected? So now I will give you the presentation of the student slideshow. I'm going to be whipping through this very quickly. Obviously you would not do that with a group of students or even a group of adults, but we just wanted you to get a comprehensive view of what we've got here. At the bottom of each slide, there are um, notes when it's not in present mode. And those notes include the attributions of any images um, that we use in the resource. And it also includes a few suggestions, but there are many more suggestions in the uh, teacher's guide. So we've done the First Nations. So we started this with an aerial photograph of Lake Simcoe and the students can take a look and this is sort of introducing them to to the lake, they can identify where they live on the lake, um, talk about what they do on the lake, etc. There are various introductory activities. And then we move into why does the lake matter? Now, you, if you're not in the Lake Simcoe um, region, you go to your local conservation authority, obviously, to find out some specific information to your, your, your watershed. At the bottom left of this slide, there is a short video on the importance of water and its uses. And it's, it is sort of geared to younger kids, but it, it gives an example, a really quick overview of why water is important. At the bottom right, there's a documentary made by the Chippewas of Georgina Island, which is longer, it's about 25 minutes about, the, about Lake Simcoe. And it's well worth watching if you're working in that area. So then the next slide, um, this is foundational information that, that students, the kids need to understand. So if it's new, it's a good teaching tool. And if it's, if, it, if it's not new to them, at least it's a reminder of the water cycle. And as you click, the different processes come up on the slide. And then we ask a question at the bottom. Does the, does the water all come back to where, it, where to the same spot? And if so, why are we told to conserve water? So it's really important, of course, that they understand that the water doesn't always come back to exactly where it was taken from. First of all, even in the natural order of things, clouds move and the rain goes somewhere else, but also humans remove water. They do locks and dams, and these things can deplete the ground 
groundwater and it can't be replenished as quickly as it's depleted. So that's an issue to talk about. Okay. Now I'm stuck here on this slide. There we go. So then we're getting into what is a watershed? And this is a, a diagram we found, a drawing of, of a watershed to sort of talk about the interconnection of the lake with the streams and rivers around it. And that red thing across the top is called a watershed divide. And every watershed has a divide. And then the next slide is an example of a watershed divide. The Oak Ridges Moraine is the watershed divide between the Lake Simcoe watershed and the Lake Ontario watershed. So the fundamental understanding that in our watershed, or in fact in any watershed, the creeks, streams, and rivers drain into the lake. And these elements of the watershed come up as you click. So then what is a subwatershed? This is Lake Simcoe again. This is from the Conservation Authority, and um, it's a relatively clear map. And uh, we have a list of possible questions to, to ask people about, ask students to see if they can identify their own sub-watershed and um, what that means in relation to the larger watershed. Now we move into the introduction to human impacts. So when the land sheds water into streams, what else is it shedding? And the next few slides show you some things that many of them will have seen just in their day-to-day -day lives, or familiar scenes. So what is being shed into the water in each of these photographs? and then brainstorm with them. How did those things like soil, salt, fertilizer, pesticides get into the streams? Where do they go? And then go back and think about the interrelation of the streams and rivers with the lake in slide eight. And what effects do you think they have on those streams, rivers, and the lake and on the species who live, in, live there? The next section is natural heritage features. And this is another slide where you click and a picture comes up. So initially you just show the photographs and see if they can name, if they can label those habitats. Natural heritage is feature is a language used by both the province and the conservation authority. But for the kids purposes, it's basically a habitat. Now in, this is in the Lake Simcoe watershed. These, these habitats exist in many areas of Ontario, but you should double check in your own area to see that it's the, the you know, which ones actually apply. And then if you click again, second time around, once they've tried to identify them, the names come up. Natural heritage features help to keep streams, rivers, and lakes and co cooler and cleaner. How else do you think they, they help? They help fight climate change and its effects. They provide habitat and they keep us healthy and happy. How do they do all that? So that's another an investigation that you can do with students. So now we're moving into natural heritage systems um, and uh, you might want to ask them if they can, if they hopefully will have done some study on different habitats and they'll know that the forest has many species, not just deer, but that's an example. And what other uh, habitats will this animal need access to and what human activities make it difficult for animals to travel from one area to another. So a road is an obvious example. The turtle, whether he'll make it across the road without being hit by a car, who knows? And of course, just built up areas are invasions of the wildlife's habitat, whereas we tend to think that wildlife invade our living areas. So this is the principle that joined together, they create natural heritage systems. And then ask the question, what natural heritage systems exist in our area? 
So this is another image from the Conservation Authority that shows ways that we can mitigate some of this human activity and help wildlife move from one area to another by creating green corridors. And that's an interesting thing to examine with the students. And now we're moving back into human impacts again. So this is a more, um, a, a little deeper dive into human impacts. So what's happening in this picture and how will water be affected? And then the foundational uh, concept that they need to understand that the more green spaces we pave over, the more contaminants will enter the water and the less of a chance we'll have to fight against climate change and its effect. And then we say, why is the water so green? And this is from the Maskinonge River on the east uh, side of Lake Simcoe. And it's because there's too much phosphorus making too much duckweed grow. So let's brain, brainstorm, what's the impact of too many aquatic plants? And then there's some great diagrams here. Here's a, here's a diagram showing the sources of the phosphorus, some of the sources and some of the species that it would affect and the type of, of land, of, uh, of bot the bottom, the lake bottom in different areas of Lake Simcoe. Uh, there may be a, a similar map for other areas. And then this shows you the, the process that goes on as um, that creates the algae blooms. Here's a summary of human impacts on water. Uh, the human, human activities on the left and the water stressors on the right and the students can match up from left to right. And obviously there's more than one stressor as a result of ag agriculture, for example. Now we're moving into something that's quite specific to Lake Simcoe. These are iconic fish in Lake Simcoe, whitefish and lake trout. People come, as, as Nari said, you know, it's a multi, it's a million dollar business fishing, fishing expeditions in Lake Simcoe. And yet these populations have depleted so much, they now have to be stocked. The lake has to be stocked to allow people to fish in it. So what other plants and animals are being affected? Here's a great poster of a freshwater lake habitat. It's, a, it's from a, a, a Great Lakes source. It just gives a really good visual of the kinds of species that live near and in a freshwater lake. So now we're moving into the area of protection. How can we reduce the amount of runoff that enters the streams? Riparian habitats. Riparian is likely a new word for many students. And so it's an important that we kind of, I, I, um, define that for them as, a, as a, a stream shoreline and get them to brainstorm what, what is the purpose of all of those trees and bushes around the shores of this stream and why are these habitats also called stream buffers. The next series of slides, I'm afraid they're a little bit unclear, but I think on a big screen they might show up better, but they're really uh, show a very clear picture of the impact of human land use on a shoreline and then best practices that can mitigate that land use. And again, they're from the Conservation Authority, but I suspect these, these could be used in any, in any watershed. So ask the students to see what is the impact, what's happening here, what sort of pollution is going into the water, what effect is it having, and then what has been done in this model that helps, that mitigates that, the effect of the human impact? And the same with a urban shoreline. What's the difference between the two? And then we come to a rural shoreline. And what's the difference between the two? So then we ask, how is the watershed being protected? And uh, the province, provincial policy, they're, they're protected areas all over the pro province. And of course, the big question is, are they being implemented? Um, this, this course um, is focused on Lake Simcoe and there are, um, there's an act, Lake Simcoe Protection Act. And if you're in the Lake Simcoe 
area, it's good to point out to the kids that this act was the result of citizen action. And then their targets in the protection plan. But I think in most conservation areas, you would have um, a list of goals and targets for um, green space, wetlands, etc. So those are the kinds of, and there's a chart of the level of achievement of the targets, like where we're at in terms of achieving the targets. And here's a map done a couple of years ago of how well protected some areas are around the lake. And it's an interesting map to look at. And then there are plans for stormwater management and you investigate, are these plans in existence where you are? Are they being implemented? Ontario also, as you, I'm sure you know this, um, already has areas of natural and scientific interest based on life science and earth science. And, the, and uh, there are two in the Lake Simcoe watershed. I'm not sure where others are, but it'd be an interesting thing to find out. And then we move to what can we do? What can we do to support the health of our streams, rivers, and the lake as individuals, as a school, and as a community? And also, how can we share what we've learned with others in our family, in our school, in our community, and beyond? So I'm going to leave, leave you there with that and let Susan take you through some things in the uh, teacher's guide. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, so um, Jenny already mentioned that uh, you're never going to sit down with your class and watch that entire slideshow. Um, so just, I, I know she already showed you the um, table of contents. Just wanted to reiterate that we've got those blue bands there to show you quickly the topics so you can easily locate the topics you want to address and find the slides and activities that go with them. So we've got a legend here to the activities as well, so you can see at a glance whether it's a brainstorming outdoor activity research activity hands on etc. So in each topic, we have the slides that address that topic and then student activities that go with it. And in some cases, we've also got background information and resources. We just wanted to point out that when we have listed resources for the First Nations history presence and knowledge around Lake Simcoe, the resources we've included are all either authored by First Nations around the lake um, and or approved by First Nations around the lake. And we would recommend that you um, do that as well for your area. Make sure you're consulting the local First Nations. Um, many of our First Nations resources are specific to Lake Simcoe, but then we've also got some that would apply to a wider area. So uh, for instance, down here, whoopsie, down here, and we've got a document as well with further resources. Okay, moving along to the watershed. So we strongly recommend that when you're teaching about the watershed, have the kids make a 3D watershed model. And whoops, I don't know why that slid down there. Anyway, so we've included a document with links to some different ways to make 3D watershed models. Um, so there are four links there. And then we've actually written out the procedure for how to make a watershed model in a sandbox or a sand pit. If you're going to make a watershed model in a sand pit, you may want to first take a look at this embedded document. So uh, this just gives you a bit of a background on some of the basic concepts like what a moraine is, what, a, what groundwater is, what headwaters are. And, um, there's a good activity in here as well. So um, before the kids actually make the watershed model in the sand, you can have them simulate the formation of a moraine. So it's right here, this activity, simulate moraine formation with your students. So I, I learned this from Jennifer Barron, 
whose outdoor education website is right here. So what she does is she has students line up side by side in the sand pit and they are going to simulate the movement of a glacier. So with their feet, they're shuffling through the sand and pushing up a ridge of sand. So it's like a glacier pushing up uh, that glacial till as the glacier recedes, recedes, and that creates a moraine, which becomes the headwaters for lots of rivers on the watershed. So now I'm gonna show you some pictures of some of those watershed models. So here are students making watershed model in sand. These students are uh, rolling out clay and draping it over empty containers to create their watershed model. And there's a link to this video in that document I just showed you. These are students I worked with who um, made a watershed model of Lake Simcoe using balled up newspaper with paper mache. And they actually took this to Queens Park and had um, MPPs do a little uh, learning experience with that model. And I'll show you what they did in a minute. And here's um, a simple one, just crumpled paper. And uh, because you're using washable marker, uh, we'll see how that works in just a minute. Okay, so back to the teacher's guide. So moving along to impacts, human impacts. So once you've made your watershed model, then you can use it to demonstrate how contaminants from, from human activities end up in rivers, lakes, groundwater, and so on. So go back to my pictures for a moment. So if students spray water on this, uh, they're going to see the marker run down and these, you know, these red ones indicate contamination. So they'll see that mix in and go into the rivers. If you're using another kind of model, then um, you're going to cover it first with a plastic sheet. White's a good color for that. So you can show up the contaminants. And then you're gonna put some little models on there uh, representing different sources of contamination, such as fertilizer, manure, faulty sewage systems, and so on. Uh, give the students spray bottles full of water. They're going to act like rain clouds raining down on the watershed. And um, they'll see that even if the contamination is actually quite far from a water source, that contamination is still gonna wash into the, all kinds of water sources. and um, sometimes it may not run over land, it might actually seep into groundwater, but what we don't see is that groundwater is often connected to rivers and lakes. And so that's a really important um, demonstration for kids to experience. And that's what we did with the MPPs at Queen Park, Queens Park, so they could learn that too. Okay, so natural heritage features. Um, so, you know, it's all about inquiry based learning right now. So you might want students uh, to divide into groups and decide what natural heritage features they're interested in. And uh, then maybe plan some field trips where they go out and visit those natural heritage features and um, answer some, try to answer some of the questions they had, or maybe they're going to go there in order to generate those questions. Either way, we hope you will go out to those natural heritage features in your watershed. And so we've created a document here that might help you plan a field trip. So again, these are the natural heritage features specific to Lake Simcoe. Some of those will be applicable to your watershed and you might have to add some, whatever. So, um, you know, even though you, you want students to generate their own questions and plan their own inquiries, sometimes it's good to have your own background information and your own set of questions so that you can kind of probe them to deepen their thinking. So we've included some of that information there for you. Um, and then once they have their questions, they might need some sources to find information. So we've vetted all of this. Here's some good sources for information. And we've got those for the different um, her natural heritage features. Here we've listed some human resources. So this would be useful if you're in the Lake Simcoe watershed or anywhere near the Oak Ridges Trail. 
associate at the Oak Ridge's Moraine. Um, but you can look for local hike leaders as well in your area who might all or, or conservation areas um, or your local conservation authority. If you're not comfortable leading your own outdoor excursion, you may be able to find people who would help you with that. And then here we've listed some um, resources that have great activities to do outdoors in those different natural heritage features with your students. Right here, these for focus on forest activities. If you click on these links, they will take you directly to lesson plans. Now they have a whole lot of lesson plans. So I went through and I found a list of ones that I could picture myself doing with kids. But you know, there's lots of others too that you might be able to picture yourself doing. Many of them are in French and English. And I'll just show you some um, pictures so you can get an idea of some of these activities. So there, I just love this picture because of the, the look of total engagement on the kids' faces. And quite often kids who are bored in class are really turned on when they're outside. Um, like this activity, because it's so simple. And now, are you seeing my, is my picture blocking the list of information here on the slide? No, no okay, good. All right, so, um, all it is is putting a plastic bag around a leaf and you might want to put it around two different kinds of leaves for leaves, for instance, a broad leaf and a needle leaf. And then you're going to see how much water collects in the bag over time. So while you're doing that, while you're waiting for that to take effect, then you can be doing some other outdoor activity. But if you look at this list on the left, it shows you just how many different topics that little experiments experiment can be used to investigate and at so many different grade levels. So that's one I really like. Here's another one called Shelter Me. So all of these are, are linked in that document I was just showing you. So this is an activity, again, pretty simple. Students are just visiting different areas of um, you know, high biodiversity compared to low biodiversity and using simple tools like magnifying glasses to see, to compare the biodiversity in those different areas. So for instance, a paved schoolyard versus a lawn versus a natural meadow or a forest. Another tool they can use is some kind of framing device. So you can actually use old picture frames, which are easily found in secondhand stores. Um, you can use a hula hoop. You can use a, a piece of rope tied in a circle. It just helps the students to focus in on a small spot. So um, they can be counting species in there. Um, how many wild species can you find? How many have been planted here? How many animals, how many plants? Uh, if you wanna do something more sophisticated with older students, you can do it um, actually have meter square frames set at um, intervals along a transect line. And in the document I just showed you there is a video that explains how to do that with older students. So those are called, that's called a quadrat study. Another activity um, is comparing root systems. So you can show them pictures, but of course it's also better to go out and actually dig some stuff up. Um, being, you know, <laughs> being careful not to destroy the environment, but looking at, for instance, the roots of mown lawn compared to some grass that has is perennial and never gets cut. And then once they see the difference between these annual plants and the perennial plants, then they can ask some questions and hopefully they'll start to, and you can sort of probe them to wonder about what effect do those root systems have on the amount of moisture that the soil can hold and on the type of soil, uh, what, and how does the soil in turn affect what's able to grow there? So out in the field, students can actually feel the difference. They can take temperatures in those differing areas. They can take a moisture meter, which you can get at a um, garden store and uh, take a moisture reading in those different areas. And so then that can be related to climate change. So if we cut down all these trees, um, is that a better defense against climate change or is having more trees a better defense against climate change and so on? Okay, so back to the teacher's guide. 
All right. So when you get to this section of talking about connecting fragmented habitats, just wanted you to see that there are some opportunities to get involved in the creation of green corridors. So to reconnect those fragmented habitats so animals have access to um, natural heritage systems because most animals need more than one kind of habitat or nat natural heritage feature in order to survive through their whole life cycle. So um, the ones listed here are um, with the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority. Again, check your own conservation authority to see if they have those opportunities. And then something that's related to green corridors is wildlife eco passages. So um, can your students become involved in a project where um, they're creating, for instance, a, a tunnel that goes underneath a road to help turtles or some other species, salamanders, for instance. So phosphorus is a huge problem for Lake Simcoe, but it may also be a huge problem in your watershed. And the thing with phosphorus is that it has such a, uh, a big effect. Um, just, I'll just show you quickly here. So uh, down here in the resources on phosphorus, there is this little four minute video, Eutrophication Explained. And uh, so that's good background information for you if some of your students are gonna study phosphorus or for them. And uh, this is a picture that shows the difference between a eutrophic and a healthy aquatic ecosystem. And I'll explain more about eutrophication in the context of these experiments that I'm gonna show you. So there's a document here, if you've got students who are interested in learning more about phosphorus, uh, this document gives you some examples of experiments that demonstrate what phosphorus, the effect that phosphorus can have on an aquatic ecosystem. Now you might want to, before you actually engage students in that experiment, you might want to do this demonstration. So this demonstration is just to help students understand the concept of how there can actually be gas, a gas in a liquid. And um, the background information in this is uh, also useful. So this gives a lot of background chemistry of water, but also a cool little table that shows you um, some common fish species and the amount of dissolved oxygen they need per liter in order to be healthy. So you can see lake trout need six milligrams of dissolved oxygen per liter, whereas carp, if you look in the little print here, can survive for long periods at two milligrams per liter. So that's why oxygen matters. And then this uh, procedure here will help you show students um, how uh, there can be oxygen in water. Okay, so now back to those experiments. I'll just show you that this document has these experiments in it with all the steps and uh, some links to other experiments and more experiments on the next page. So now without going through that in too much detail, I'll just show you pictures of those experiments. So right here, um, so you're gonna have three jars of equal amounts of water. Two of these jars of water are gonna come from your, one of your local water sources. This third jar here is the control. So that actually is just half water that you've left with the lid off so that the um, chlorine can evaporate. So in these two jars here of your local water, you're going to add some fertilizer to one and not to the other. And then, um, you know, students can graph this if they're older students or, but even with younger students, you could help graph this with them. Um, with this particular experiment, you're gonna need some way to measure the oxygen level in the water. So in that document, I just closed, um, it, there are some examples of how you can measure oxygen in water. 
Um, so what you can see from this graph is that initially the jar that has the most fertilizer added to it is having the most plant growth. And of course those plants are breathing out oxygen. So as the students see all this, I mean, there's so many questions they can be asking and, and you're gonna be getting them to try to figure out what's going on on their own to the greatest extent possible. So fertilizer is winning in terms of oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the water until those plants die. So in the experiment, you're actually gonna cover the jars and then put them in a dark place for a while. And then what they see is that the one that had the most plants and the most oxygen suddenly has almost no oxygen. So it's entered the dead zone with less than two milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. And you might want to put right alongside that graph, the uh, chart I showed you earlier that shows the different fish and the different, their different oxygen requirements. So they can see which fish are gonna die if there are so many weeds or so much um, algae in the water. And I'll just explain this to you quickly, this whole eutrophication process. What happens is that when the plants die, they become food for bacteria. The more plants you have dying, the more bacteria proliferates. And it's the bacteria that use up the oxygen in the water as they, through the process of decomposition. So as those bacteria are decomposing the plants, they're using up the oxygen in the water. So that's that relationship there. Um, so here's a different um, experiment. So in this one, really simple, the kids would just bring in a couple of samples of local water again. In this case, it already has to have some algae in it. And uh, I think probably it's a job for you to bring in the invasive uh, for the invasive mussel species. So in Lake Simcoe, we have quagga mussels and zebra mussels. You might have those in your body of water too. And uh, they're really sharp. So this is probably a job for the teacher. And uh, you even the teacher wants to use gloves handling these mussels. So you put them in and very quickly, you're going to see that water clarify. So then the students can be asking, how did that happen? And then what's the significance of that? What effect is that going to have on the entire ecosystem? And in that experiment document, we've got a link to a website that will actually explain the science there. Okay, so we're going back to the teacher's guide now. Um, so we mentioned earlier how important we think it is for kids to uh, go to those natural heritage features. Likewise, we hope they're going to go to a visit, uh, go on a visit to a stream or a pond or some other water source. And again, great opportunity to answer some questions that they've already formulated or great opportunity to formulate questions. Um, and we've created this document to help you with that field trip as well. So just some general tips for outdoor trips can be found on these two links here. Here are some human resources that can help with trips. Again, these are pretty specific to our area, but um, I'm sure you can find some in your area as well. Here again is uh, water testing information if you wanna do water testing with the kids. So you can actually borrow test kits from waterrangers.ca, which I believe is across Canada. Um, we've listed some shoreline activities here. So things to look for. And again, students can generate these ideas themselves um, and or you can and you can incorporate these into things like scavenger hunts. So maybe you can have a series of scavenger hunt or different kids doing different scavenger hunts. Um, you might want to provide the kids with some guides. So like guides to picture pictorial guides of invasive species, things like that. And then be thinking about so based on what they see, what are the implications of that? What does it tell them about how healthy that ecosystem is or what the human impacts are, so on. And here's a list of some activities you can do, pretty easy, straightforward and impactful activities you can do if you go on a shoreline visit. 
And then we've created a really in-depth guide to a dip netting trip because I think dip netting is the best. And um, unfortunately, really the best time to do it is in the spring um, or early fall, late summer, or the summer, of course, if you happen to have students in the summer. Um, so you're a bit restricted to when you can do it, but anyhow, if you can do it, because it's so fantastic. So we've got um, a lot of resources here to help you with that. So things that they would take on the trip with them and step-by-step -step procedure of actually how to do it. And then some questions again to deepen their thinking. So I'll just show you some pictures again of some of those things I just discussed. So here again, uh, if you go to a lake shore, is this a natural sand or was that brought in? Uh, what's the difference to the water if there are plants versus no plants? How does that affect the lake temperature? Uh, what effect does temperature have on an ecosystem, on an aquatic ecosystem? What kind of human impact do you see here? What kind of natural things can you find here? What signs of animals, even if you don't see actual animals? That's the sort of thing. Here are just some examples of invasive species that we have in our area that kids could look for. They can do an investigation of rocks and minerals, erosion. They can create artwork. And all of these activities will lead them to, you know, generate a whole bunch of new questions and new areas for study. This is just a picture of those uh, water rangers testing kits I was mentioning and students using them. All right, on to my favorite, the dip netting. So what they're looking for is benthic macroinvertebrates. So that just means small animals that live on the bottom of, of the uh, river or pond or lake. And uh, some of the animals you find will actually have backbones, but some of them will be invertebrates. I'm not wild about the fact that these kids are standing in the river. I prefer if they do it from the side. These kids have little nets, but if you can find bigger ones from your outdoor ed center, that would be great. Um, and you want them to be scooping on the surface and down lower and then up the side of whatever structure they're on because lots of creatures will be clinging to that. And then also down into the mud. So you need something with long handles. And all of this is spelled out in that document I showed you. Then you're gonna have some um, containers with white bottoms that you're gonna put water from that water source into so the students can look more closely at what they've found. And in that document, there's also a link to this card here, which um, is really interesting because what the students find is going to tell them so much about the health of the aquatic ecosystem that they have been investigating. So if they're only finding these species here, that's an indication that the water is low in oxygen. And when the water's low in oxygen, that could be an indication that there's some sort of pollution problem like phosphorus. If they're finding all of these on this side, that's an indication of high oxygen and a healthier aquatic ecosystem. Okay, back to our teacher's guide again. So, um, Eutrophication explained human impacts. Okay, I think we went through most of that. All right, wanted to show you that um, we do have background information, not just for phosphorus, but for other contaminants as well. So road salt, invasive species, that's huge. Other chemical contaminants. Climate change, of course, is huge. So these are all things you might want to look into. And I think quite a few of the resources we've supplied there uh, apply in many areas. Um, if you are doing an investigation of food change and food webs, this document here may be helpful to you because we've listed a whole bunch of plants and animals, or actually more animals that exist in a sort of a typical freshwater food chain food web. So you could use this for instance to, the kids could use those to create their food chains, food webs, and they could do research on their own local water 
source. So let's say they did that dip netting, dip netting activity, then they would use the animals they found to create a food chain food web and plants they would have to include, of course, as well. And some more um, information here if they want to do deeper research. Okay. Um, all right. Just making sure, I just want to make sure that we're showing you everything. Oh, yeah. So if you, if students are investigating the um, effects of buffer zones on local water sources, here are some good experiments they might want to try. So again, I'll show you pictures of those. So the forest sponge, um, so you can see pretty easily what the setup is here, and they're going to pour equal amounts of water into each of these bottles and find out what happens. So what will the water look like when it comes out the other side? How much water will come out the other side? What does that tell us about the difference between a planted area versus a non-planted area? Similar thing with a wetland, pouring equal amounts of water into your little simulated wetland here versus an area that has earth but nothing growing and versus an area that has just pavement. How, how, how does the amount of water that comes through differ? How does the quality of water that comes through differ? Similar thing here, the sponge here represents the wetland. So you're taking some muddy water and pouring it in to your little wetland or your area here minus the sponge and then with the sponge and comparing the amount of runoff and what the water looks like. And here, this shows the implications if there were a town on the other side. What if you didn't have that wetland and there was a heavy rain event? Okay, we're getting down to our final section in the teacher's guide. And that is protection and taking action. So we started out our presentation tonight showing a student who took action by creating her own video that she was using to try to educate others about problems confronting Lake Simcoe and how she is trying to combat those problems. We hope your students will also take action to protect their watersheds. So we've listed a whole lot of actions here that students can become involved in. So one of them is creating a riparian buffer. Um, and that's what these students are doing in this picture. So they're planting native species alongside a river and that's going to help the river in multiple ways. So first of all, it's gonna shade the water, keeping the water cooler so that there's gonna be more dissolved oxygen in that water and make it more biologically diverse. Um, they're now creating a habitat. And so quite often those corridors that connect different natural heritage systems naturally would follow a river. So if we can have all of our rivers buffered that way, we're also creating a corridor system for wildlife to travel along. Um, this is preventing erosion of sediment, it's preventing runoff of contaminants into the stream. So great activity to get your students involved in. Another one, some other ones, let's see here. So, uh, okay, so I'm gonna show you the Yellowfish Road in a little bit. So I'll just let you scan down the list here. You can peruse those at your leisure. Most of these activities will apply to anybody anywhere. And then we do have some specific like Simcoe based ones. Um, okay, shoreline cleanup, that's something that's across Canada. Yellowfish Road Program, we used to have that here in Newmarket, uh, but you can check online. And even if they don't have it, you could probably just do it yourself. So what that is, 
Oh, I forgot. I know. So lots of um, conservation authorities are very keen to have volunteers help get rid of invasive plant species, because what these species do is they're um, crowding out the native species. For instance, in forests, we've got dog strangling vine that's making it impossible for little saplings and wildflowers to grow, and that has huge repercussions all over the food chain. So um, students can get involved with uh, invasive species eradication. So back to the Yellowfish Road program. So it's just painting fish um, using road paint next to storm sewers as a reminder to local people that nobody should be pouring anything down these storm sewer grates. Uh, it's only for rain because when we have heavy rain events that can cause uh, whatever goes down here to mix straight into rivers and lakes. Um, so you also, the students would also create um, information to hand out to local people where they have painted those. And by the way, speaking of storm sewers and infrastructure, in the teacher's guide, we've also included a document with more information on that kind of infrastructure and a mini uh, PowerPoint presentation about that as well. So you can find that in the teacher's guide as well. Just seeing if they're, so I think that's, it. Okay, I'm going to hand you back over to Jenny now. Hi, I, I've sort of lost my, my documents, but really this is just thank you all so much for coming. And if you use this resource, we'd love to hear from you. We're not asking for detailed feedback, obviously. We know everyone's very busy, but just let us know. And we'll, our contact information will be sent out along with the copy of the slideshow and the teacher's guide so that you can, our emails, uh, Susan's and my email will be, be sent out along with that. So I think now we have a few minutes for any questions or comments that people wanted to make and Istafa I think was going to facilitate that. Yeah, so at this point, if uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to either turn on your mic and ask them directly, or you can write them in the chat and I can read them out uh, for Susan and Jenny. Hi, everybody. I don't have a I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to say, wow, that was uh, so interesting and so, so much helpful information. I think much of which we can apply here. We um, have a small um, river um, near the school that we work out of and um, we raise salmon here and release them there in the spring. And so we we do actually quite a bit of learning about the river with the kids. So I think all the invasive species, there's going to be a lot of things that we can use to layer in. So thank you. That was really great. You're welcome. Thank you.